You know, it's been almost two and a half years since I retired from being the senior pastor here at Eagle Brook Church. It was a role I had for 29 years that I am so grateful for. I can't believe God allowed me to be a part of it. It was the highest honor of my life. If you were to ask me what matters most, what I've given my whole life to, it's that all of you would know Jesus, that you would put your full faith in him and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Receive his forgiveness, his healing, his wholeness, and just come home. I was definitely ready to be done, but one of the questions people ask me is, do I miss it? Honestly, parts of it I do. I miss the staff. I miss seeing all of you week in and week out. And I miss the opportunity to impact people for Jesus. But I don't miss the 24-7 stress, the sleepless nights, and the toll that writing and delivering weekly messages took on me. Retirement took a little while for me to get used to, but I've been able to do more of the things that I truly love in life, like hunting and fishing, biking and golfing. Mostly though, I've enjoyed being home with my wife, my family, and now six grandkids. And just in case you forgot about him, Blue continues to chase the mailman, does ungodly things at the dog park, and he's the cause of most of our marital tension. But he's the best hunting dog I've ever had, so all is forgiven. <laughs> How you doing? Where's a bike for me? How about if we play a game over here? A little soccer? <laughs> you want to do the slip and slide? Whoa! The last two and a half years have really been good for my soul. And as I reflect on them, I can pinpoint several things that I've learned about life. So when Jason asked me if I'd be willing to return and speak at Eagle Brook this summer, I was all in. But gang, it's not easy. You'd think standing on the same platform I've spoken hundreds of messages from would be simple. But honestly, you all make me a little nervous. But it is great to be back. I'm truly excited, truly thankful to be with you again. Now let's just hope I don't screw it up. That's enough. <laughs> That's enough of that. Thank you. <laughs> I feel very honored uh, for that. Very unnecessary. If cl my closest friends are th thinking he's just he's just a little bald guy. <laughs> um, you know, obviously, I've got a lot of emotions uh, standing here today. Um, but the main one being gratitude, just for what God's done in this church and what He continues to do. Um, two weeks ago, over a 1,000 people in this church were baptized, and they declared their faith in Jesus Christ, and I was just blown away by that. Yeah. So proud of those of you who took that step of faith, and then just this last week, over a three-day period, 1,500 middle school kids each day came and filled this campus, and we're pursuing a relationship with God through Christ. And I just have to tell you, you know, they didn't come to a concert. They didn't come to a sporting event. 1,500 middle school students came to a church. And I'm telling you, there's hope when that happens in this world. So proud of those kids and the volunteers who made that happen. And every week, uh, my family and I come to church. And we sit right over here to my right. Uh, and we don't miss it. I'm just so grateful for this church. I'm so grateful for Jason, who I believe is in the top 1% of the gifted leaders and teachers in our nation. Most people have no idea how hard it is and the work that goes into what a senior pastor does. But Jason gets it, and he steps up to the plate. I'm so grateful for him. Who, by the way, along with, along with Ryan and John, I think make an unbeatable team. For our worship staff, that's second to none. I'm so grateful for our student and kids' ministries every week. No kidding. Our grandkids just run into Elevate and Cadodio. So I'm so, so grateful for our staff. You know, uh, leading up to retirement, 
a couple of years ago, uh, the board and I spent a lot of time thinking and planning for the right time. And everything was in place, perfectly planned. So I retired March 1st, 2020. <laughs> and you remember what happened just a few days later? I mean, the whole country just went to pot, and I was like, oh, I bailed just in time. Uh, but as bad as these past two years have been for the country and world, I see huge opportunities for our church. Because when a nation is forced into isolation from family and friends, the need for God's love and healing has never been greater. And when many of our nation's leaders no longer know the difference between right and wrong, between good or evil, the need for God's truth has never been greater. I mean, you tell me, who has the answer to the brokenness, violence, and chaos all of that has caused over these past couple of years? Can technology solve our moral and relational problems in this world? Can tech do it? Will our universities lead us back to truth? Will social media protect our families and lead our kids to God and faith? Will government? <laughs> Not a chance. <laughs> Only Jesus through the church can restore truth, save our families, and heal our nation. And I am just so proud of Jason, Ryan, and John for staying on course I can tell you something. This church will always stand on biblical truth that leads to life and true freedom. Gang, it is the hope of the world. And I, I say this in true love for every person hearing these words. If some of you have gotten complacent about God and church, you are putting yourself and your family at risk. My family and I never miss church. And by the way, so grateful for online. Glad you joined us today. But we come in person. Something happens when you're in the, in, the room, in, in the room with other believers worshiping the same God. There is an encouragement. God does something unique. And so if you've gotten a little wobbly about church attendance, I'm just here to say it's time to come back. And this place is filled today. And I'm so glad you're here. God's at work in this church. So, I had to get that off my chest, so here we go. <laughs> you know, these past two years, I've thought a lot about life and what matters and what brings happiness. And in a minute, I'm going to show you three phrases that I think answers that question. What brings fulfillment? But a question people ask when you retire is, what's on your bucket list? Because they assume there's a list of things that an, that an ultimate vacation, food, drink, ballpark, whatever, will fulfill your life. That if you can go there and experience, you will have made it. You'll, you'll reach the pinnacle. Some people think it's grandkids. I don't get that. <laughs> Several months ago, um, Laura and I got the call to watch David and Sarah's boys, Hank and Cy age four and two. Then because it was Saturday, my son-in-law brought their three kids over, Ibby, Maisie, and Hayes. So we're at my son David's house, and somehow I got separated from the other two adults. Laurie and Nellie went downstairs with the baby, and I got stuck alone with the other four kids upstairs. And I don't know why, but whenever I'm with the kids, it goes from playing nicely to just utter chaos and carnage. And first, it starts out this way. It's the track meet. Just running full speed through the living room and kitchen, round and round, screaming their heads off. Laurie and Nellie said it sounded like a stampede upstairs. And I was like, well, yeah, but they never came up to help. <laughs> I was sitting on the couch watching this track meet. When Maisie, age three, peeled off the running meat and launched herself onto my lap, nearly ruining me. <laughs> she grabbed for my glasses and found great joy in just trying to rip them off my face. And while fending her off, 
Ibby landed on my back, followed by the boys who ran full speed and just threw themselves on top of me. This was my honest to God thought. This is what I thought. This is Lord of the Flies. <laughs> and I'm the pig. And they're just going to kill me. After knocking a couple of them off, Hank picked up a ball and threw it at me. I thought, okay, game on. I fired back, and that's all it took. A teddy bear went sailing across the room. Then anything they could get their hands on. There was toys all over, dolls, monkeys. Blocks and cars were going through the air. I said, Silas, no cars. Hank, drop that truck. No kidding, he had a fire truck. It got so out of control. The only thing I could do was leave. So I headed for the basement, and no kidding, just before I reached the stairs, a metal truck came sailing past my head, nicked my ear, crashed into the wall. I didn't even look back. I just headed downstairs. Uh, four kids followed me down with ammo in their hands. Finally, my wife yelled, that's enough. Then she looked at me. She said, why didn't you do something? I said, they're total barbarians. I said, who's raising these kids anyway? Now, obviously, we love our grandkids. <laughs> but, if, if you're, but if you're waiting for grandkids to complete your life and make you happy, forget it. Because all the while, you're longing for grandkids or some other bucket list experience. You will miss the gift of right now, this very moment that God's given us. You know, due to my job in our church, I've been able to travel to a lot of places and meet some of the smartest people in the world. And I can tell you, there's not a place on the planet, there's not a person you can meet or marry that can make you forever happy. So I don't have a bucket list. Honestly, I don't. Because there's nothing out there that can meet the need that we all have for happiness. There's no delivery from Amazon Prime, no ultimate food or trip. Gang, the secret to finding fulfillment and joy in this life is in this moment right now, in this day, today. Look what the Bible says about this. This day, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us be, rejoice and be glad in this day, no matter what's going on, in this moment. The question is, how do we do that? Well, there's a guy in the Bible who uh, lived for the bucket list. And he wrote three books, The Song of Solomon, when he was young and in love. And you ought to read that sometime. It's, yeah. He wrote Proverbs when he became a dad. And he, he wrote a book of wisdom to his sons. And that's a fantastic book. And then at the end of his life, he wrote Ecclesiastes. And it's about everything he chased in this world and the regrets that followed. Now look what he writes about this really grand experiment that he was on. He said, I wanted to see what was worthwhile in life. Don't we all want to do that? So I did this experiment. I had the resources to do it. I built houses, plural, for myself. I planted vineyards, gardens, fruit trees. I bought male and female servants. I owned more herds than anyone in Jerusalem, he said, I amassed silver, gold, and the treasures of kings. I acquired singers and a harem for entertainment. I denied myself nothing. Yet, when I surveyed all my hands had achieved, everything, Everything was meaningless. It was a chasing after the wind. By the way, did you notice the pronouns in this? It's all about him. I amassed, I acquired, I denied, I surveyed. It was all about him. 
And I can tell you when it's all about you, that leads to loneliness and emptiness, the opposite of fulfillment. Solomon checked every box on the bucket list, and you know what he said? It's not worth it. He said, don't waste your life chasing things that can't deliver what we all crave. Love, joy, fulfillment. I mean, as soon as he acquired one thing, he got bored with it, so he went looking for another, but nothing did it for him. It also dawned on him that he's going to die someday and that every garden property and stash of gold will be left behind for somebody else who doesn't deserve it, probably. And gang, over the past two years, I've had a lot of time to think about what brings fulfillment. And I believe this to my core. There is no such thing as an ultimate possession, place, or experience that'll satisfy our deepest longings for love and fulfillment. Now, does that mean we shouldn't golf and hunt or remodel our homes? No, you should do that. I do those things and I enjoy them. He's just saying that none of it can deliver what we ultimately all want. So, are you ready for this? Over the past two years, here's what I think leads to a blessed life. Number one, value people. Now, no surprise there. But people are the greatest source of pain in our lives. Isn't that true? They are a pain, and they cause pain. People are the greatest source of pain in our lives, but they are also the greatest source of joy. To quote the great theologian Garth Brooks, he said, you know, I could have missed the pain of relationships because it's messy, it's frustrating. I could have missed it, but I'd have had to miss the dance if I didn't enter into relationship. And I know for some of you, the pain's been unbearable because somebody be betrayed you. Somebody stole from you or abused you in some way, and the wounds are so raw that you vow you would never trust anyone again. And I get it. And I'm so very sorry for the pain that some of you have endured. And by the way, some of you have toxic people in your friendship group. They're hurtful. They need to get well before you get close to them. And some of you need to put some boundaries around these hurtful relationships. My prayer is that you will ask God for healing if you've been wounded, because healthy relationships lead to a fulfilled life, and Solomon missed that. He had great wealth, but he didn't value people, so he missed the dance. In fact, in chapter 4, verse 8, he says, there was a man all alone. He neither had son nor brother. He's actually talking about himself. He had sons, and he had brothers, but he's got the boats, cars, and houses, but neither his sons nor his brothers want anything to do with them, and he regrets it. And so he looks back on his life, and he says, look, two are better than one. Don't do life alone, because if one falls down, his friend or his son or his brother can help him up, but pity the person who has no one. That if you go through life without the love of family and friends, gang, nothing on your bucket list is going to help that. And I wonder today, who helps you when you fall? Who's always there for you? You know, uh, for years, <laughs> I tried to avoid people. I, I don't know if that surprises you or not, but... Uh, you know, and there's an art to this. You, uh, you know, hat down in public, no eye contact. You make eye contact, you're dead. No eye contact. Walk fast, give one word responses, and I put very little value on relationships. 
For 20 years I did this. It was hurting my family. It was hurting my friendships. But you know the truth? It, mainly it was hurting me. It's what landed me in front of a counselor for over a year. Because I was missing the dance. So for a long time I did that. But today I can honestly tell you that people are my greatest joy. And it's what's happening in what I call this unplanned interruptions, which used to annoy me to no end. But about a year ago, I was writing in my journal, and God just spoke to me by his spirit. And I wrote these words down, Bob, be open to unplanned interruptions at the grocery store, the airport, at the gym. The gym's the worst. I mean, you got 38 minutes, you got to run four miles, lift weights, and get out of there. And then someone walks up to you and says, hey, how was your week? I'm like, oh, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> and I just felt God's spirit say, Bob, get over that. Because these are opportunities to value people. And I think... There's two ways, there's many ways, but there's two primary ways to value people. Notice them. Look at them and smile. Is it going to kill you, some of you, to smile? Smile at people. It's a good thing. Second, speak kind words to them. How are you doing? Great to see you. I'm proud of you. I saw a short video of an artist who rides the subway in New York City, and he actually draws sketches of people without them noticing that he's doing that. And then he hands them the sketch. Watch this short clip, and then I'll come back. Excuse me, miss. Miss, I drew you. I did this drawing of you. <laughs> Are you okay? Why the emotion? Because someone noticed her. and valued her. Anybody in your life who's hoping that you'll notice them and value them. Say, I love you, I'm proud of you. That's where the dance is. Value people. Second, wake up grateful. I love this phrase. So again, Solomon's done it all. He has it all. But he, he says the second way to fulfillment is to wake up grateful for the little things. He says, go eat your food with gladness. Drink your wine with a grateful heart. For it is now that God favors what you do. Not tomorrow, but now. You know, one of the questions that I, that I just want to raise, you know, what, what is your first thought every morning you wake up? Because someday you, someday you won't. So what's your first thought when you wake up? Is it, wow, wow, I lived through another night. <laughs> and God is giving me another day. Or does one day just kind of roll into the next without any thought of how amazing life is? For about 20 years, I, I didn't wake up grateful. I woke up grumpy, stressed, but not grateful. And I just want to challenge us. First thought of the day, man, I'm alive. Of all the billions of people who've come and gone, God is giving me this day. I wonder why. 
What is God? How does he want me to live this day? Every morning I sit in my favorite spot with coffee, my Bible, and a good book. And my first words of prayer out of my mouth are, God, thank you for allowing me to see another day, to hear it, to feel it, to taste it and smell it. The first taste of morning coffee is mind-blowing, which my wife has no idea about. I don't get it. It's one little flaw that she has. (laughs) Just one little one. I open my Bible and I thank him for his truth that feeds my soul and guides my life. I thank him for his forgiveness that's given to every single one of us who receive his forgiveness by faith in Christ and to know that heaven is real and that someday we're going to be there forever and all eternity. Then I look up and right behind me are family photos. Some of them are of my wife and me, others of the kids, their weddings and our grandkids. And gang, by God's grace, none of those portraits are shattered or torn. I mean, like every family, we have our issues, of course. But I look at those photos and I think, I am so grateful, God, that I didn't lose Lori somewhere along the way. I'm so glad I have the respect of my kids and a lifetime of memories that are only ours. God, I'm just so grateful for the gift of my family, but here's the problem for some people. Their favorite day is someday. Someday, when I get more money, then I'll be grateful. Someday when I graduate, someday when I get married and have kids, then I'll be happy. Really? Have you seen some marriages? Kids are crazy. Someday, you know, someday when the kids leave and I lose 20 pounds, remarry, and move to Tennessee, then I'll be grateful. Probably not. Because if you're not grateful today, you won't be grateful someday. Biggest mistake people make is they live for someday. And they end up missing the blessings of today. And I know that waking up grateful is hard. When you've got young kids, for example, Nora Ephraim writes these words, a child is a grenade that sets off an explosion in your home that rattles everything. So true. And I know that waking up hard... Grateful is hard when you're exhausted as a mom, a dad. Or you can't conceive. Or you're financially insecure. Or you're single, wishing you were married. Or worse, married, wishing you were single. Life is really hard and often unfair. Jesus said, you know, in this world, you will have trouble. This is a flawed world. But he said, take heart. I have overcome this world. We all have our share of problems in life, but we have a way through those problems. Gang, in Jesus, we have access to a power and wisdom and help to get us through and overcome the struggles that we all have in life. Paul said it this way, In all things, in all things, not just some things, all things, good and bad, God has a way of working for the good, uses all things in our life to work for the good. Here's the qualifier, for those who love him. This isn't for everyone. This is for those who have a relationship with God through Christ. And some of you are sitting there saying, Bob, You have no idea what happened. I don't see God's work in my life. I don't see what good is coming. And sometimes you won't see it right away. Sometimes it might be years from now. 
the pain that you went through, and God, suddenly you'll see, oh, God is working, even using that for the good in my life. Uh, if we can learn to wake, wake up grateful for the small things, we'll begin to see God's goodness in all things. So, value people, wake up grateful. Third one is this, find a purpose. Find a purpose. Uh, John Alexander, a couple weeks ago, said find a cause. I love that language as well. Um, Solomon's at the top, remember? He's at the top of everything. He's written books. He's traveled the world. He's amassed wealth, denied himself nothing. But all of that, look what he says, look what he concludes after all of that. He says there's nothing better I wonder what that is. There's nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in your work. This is the gift of God. Have you ever thought of work as a gift? There were times when my work almost destroyed me. I wondered if I could survive, and I'd fantasize about the day I could retire, move to Montana, fish, trout, hunt elk for the rest of my life every day, but... What people in their 50s, 60s, and 70s struggle with the most is purpose. After I stopped working full-time two years ago, I realized that work was an absolute gift, as hard as it was. It's where I gained skills. I grew in wisdom. I made friends, had influence. It gave me a purpose that just absolutely filled my life. And Solomon says there's nothing better. And sometimes it's not the work itself, but it's the people at your work that you can have an impact on. I was coming through the Atlanta airport a while back, and I grabbed a Chick-fil-A, and I sat down in the food court, and there was the most delightful grandmother-type lady just cleaning tables. And it was the height of COVID, so everybody was ornery. But her goal was to make everybody feel welcome in this food court. And her favorite word was hun. You okay, hun? How you doing, hun? Can I get that for you, hun? Everybody was hun. So I said for everybody to hear, I said, do you call everyone hun? She said, sure do. I smiled, went back to my sandwich. Ten seconds later, she snuck up behind me and said this. But I'd call you baby. <laughs> I kid you not. I kid you not. But I call you, I mean, shivers when I'm going, what's going on? I said, I got to get a photograph of you. But I thought, here's a person who's in a lower level job, but she values people wakes up grateful, and she looks for purpose in helping others. Probably doesn't have a lot of money. But she was the happiest person I saw in the airport that day. And gang, what I've learned these past two years is that I still need a purpose. Ephesians 2.10, you, every one of you, and me, all of us, are God's workmanship. We just didn't show up or evolve from a plant. God created you. Knows you, gave you personality. You are God's workmanship created for this purpose to do something good. How do you know if something is purposeful? At least two ways. I could list a lot of them. It has something to do with helping others. It's others focused. It's not yourself. It's others focused. And it will require a sacrifice of time and effort and inconvenience. But I'm telling you. This is where the dance is. This is where fulfillment is. So I've started to travel and speak, which I said I wouldn't do. <laughs> in fact, a few months ago, I was sitting alone in an Indianapolis hotel on a Saturday night, and I thought, what am I doing here? And all the same feelings of stress and anxiety and fear that comes with speaking were just right there. My very next thought was, this is exactly where I'm supposed to be. 
teaching at a great church, helping their pastor, encouraging their staff. For some of you, your main purpose is raising your kids. Pastor Andy Stanley said these fantastic words, your greatest contribution to the world may not be what you do, but who you raise. So true. For some of you, it's supporting your spouse or caring for an aging parent or praying for people. For some of you, you're leading a Bible study or you're just, you're just available to help when others need it. But I'm telling you the truth, gang. If you want to minimize the regret factor in your life and maximize fulfillment, you have to have a purpose that helps others and requires sacrifice. A couple months ago, uh, Lori and I flew to North Carolina to visit her parents who are 92. Uh, Mary Lou is, is losing her eyesight. She's losing her memory. They've lost most of their friends. And Life is closing in on them. Fantastic Christian people. Um, Kay was an architect, fantastic athlete. Could never beat him in tennis. Irritated me. <laughs> um, but while we were there in Carolina, I noticed that whenever they sat next to each other, Kay would put his hand on Mary Lou's knee and then she would put both her hands on his, as if to say, we don't have much left, but we have each other. We have our faith in Jesus. We have the love of our family, which is the best. And we have the promise of heaven. And in the end, that's enough. And what I want to tell you today is that Solomon missed most of that. He amassed wealth. He had endless properties and possessions. But he ended up empty and alone. And I don't want that to happen to any of us. I don't want that to happen to me. I don't want to end up empty. I looked at Mary Lou and my father-in-law Kay. And I thought this thought, I want what they have, what they've had all their life. But it won't happen if I don't value people, if I don't wake up grateful every day, and if I don't find a purpose that helps others. And it won't happen if I don't have Jesus Christ the center of my life. I just won't. At the very end of Ecclesiastes, this book that Solomon wrote, he has this moment of clarity. After he's evaluated the whole thing, he's been very honest about it, he has this moment of clarity. It's the very last verse in chapter 12. He says, look, I've done it all. I've experienced it all. And here's my conclusion. Fear God and keep his commands. For this is the ball game. This is the entire deal. And it doesn't mean to be afraid of God. It simply means to revere him as your creator, your Lord, your guide, your savior, the one who loves you and knows you is crazy about you. Revere him. Worship him. Get to know him better and better. Because that's the deal. The whole deal. So, how are we doing? Where might you need to focus in the next week or so? 
Do you need to get better at valuing people? You need to start being grateful for all things. Do you need to finally find a purpose that's not about you, but it's about others? And do you need to invite God into your life, maybe for a second or third time, and reestablish this relationship with the God who loves you and knows you? Let me pray for you. We'll be done. Father, thanks so much for your word. Thanks for the joy of life, friendship, family. Most of all, God, thank you for your son, Jesus. Lord, thank you for coming to this world and paying the price, the ultimate sacrifice for all of our sin, that if we put our faith in you, Jesus Christ, you will forgive us and cleanse us because you paid the debt. You paid the price. And all we need to do is say thank you. I love you, worship you, in Christ's name. Hey, I love you. I love this church. Thanks for letting me come. God bless you all. Yeah. Thank you.